I uh, grew up in a home where my parents would have me say my prayers during different rhythms of our day. So there were prayers that we would pray before meals and before bedtime and different things like that. I don't know if you guys have any kind of experience with this, but like before we would pray often, there were these cute prayers that rhymed that we would pray like at meals. Like maybe you guys remember this, God is great, God is good, let us thank him for our Oh, look at you Christians. Look at you. By his hands, we all are fed. Thank you, Lord, for daily. This is before we knew that bread was bad for us and all that carved stuff. But anyway, if you're really in a hurry to pray, um, but you still wanted to be spiritual, you do the real short version, which was good food, good meat. Thank God. So spiritual. So, so deep. But the one that really gets me is the prayer that I, I believe, I think we prayed this before bed all the time when we were little kids. What in the world? It's crazy, but it's, uh, it goes a little something like this. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And then it got really dark. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. What were we doing? It's like little kids asking all these dark, deep questions that they were not prepared for. And Mom, I, I see your heart in that and praying these prayers. It's a beautiful, yeah. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. I will hear about that later. Um, But we did those kind of prayers that were cute and they rhymed and then we grew up a little bit, right? And the way that we prayed, it needed to grow up with us. We found out that a lot of things that we pray for, it wasn't like pulling a lever on a slot machine. It wasn't like rubbing a magic lamp to get what we wanted. Sometimes we wanted things. We asked God for things and it just didn't happen. And that reality uh, led many of us at different points of our life, or maybe you're in this place right now, to where you just stopped praying because it just didn't seem to work the way that we wanted it to. And what we've been doing in this series is that hopefully we've been like reshaping and re-envisioning what prayer was always supposed to be about and how we can have a vibrant life of prayer talking to God where God always says yes to the things that we pray for. And that requires us to think differently about what prayer is. That requires us to think differently about the things we ask for and the posture in which we come to God to pray. Because I don't know about you, but I just drift into, I float into praying prayers that are give me, give me, give me, give me this, where I am the center of all of my prayers, But the God of the scriptures, the God uh, that is revealed to us most perfectly in Jesus, uh, the prayers that he was all about, the prayers that his forefathers were all about in his faith, were always prayers that were bigger prayers, that were prayers that required trust and a big, audacious faith. And there were prayers of not just give me this, but it was prayers of participation and partnership with God to be on the mission that God was on. And so the last couple of weeks, we've looked at a couple of these, what's called them dangerous prayers that God always says yes to. The first week we talked about the prayer of God, make me bold. God, give me boldness to see opportunities where I can partner with you to where I can join you in bringing the up there down here, where I can join you in spreading your goodness. Last week, we talked about the dangerous prayer. God, search me and know me and test me and lead me in the way everlasting. And this search me prayer was a prayer that helps us really see what's going on underneath the hood of our lives so that we can not just drift through our life, but follow Jesus through our life. And this week, the dangerous prayer that God always says yes to, if you have the chutzpah, see, I got the chutzpah going on there, to pray it, is this right here. Speak to me, God. God, I want to hear you speak. Talk to me. Speak to me. Now, just full disclosure, um, for me personally, and maybe this is not you, and if it's not you, I'd love to hear your story later, but I have never heard the audible voice of God. I've never had like the Morgan Freeman voice in my ear. I don't know why we always think that like the voice of our God is kind of British and regal, like Obi-Wan Kenobi. Luke, turn off your targeting computer or something. That was a terrible accent. Please don't <laughs> cancel me for that. But I just like, I've never heard that kind of voice. And so if, if you're in the same boat, like, man, I'm with you and don't feel bad about that. But what's interesting, there's a question underneath of this request for God to speak to me. It's like the thing underneath the thing. And often when we're begging God to speak to us, when we want to hear what God has for us, what we're really saying is not just God speak to us, it's God tell me what to do in this situation. I need a dose of wisdom. I'm at a fork in the road. I don't know what to do. So God, would you tell me what I should do? 
That's really what we're asking often when we say, God, speak to me, is that we need you know, a hit of God's wisdom. We need to know what to do. And sometimes we bring this before God and it could be silly and we wanna hear God's voice like we're standing in front of our closet on Monday morning, like, what should I wear, God? And he's like, wear the polo, my son. Uh, or, like, or you're in a drive-thru and you're like, man, what should I do? And he's like, you know, order the number two, my child, or something like that. Or if you're a student, you're getting ready to take tests again, or if you've got summer classes going on, you'd love to hear God's voice say, it's C, like, you know, fill in the bubble on the Scantron, it's answer C, right? We would love that, but other times we ask God to give us direct wisdom into our circumstances for things that are heavier. Like, God, I have this opportunity to take this new job with this new team, this new organization. Should I leave what I'm doing? And should I, like, take this job? God, speak to me, tell me what I should do. Sometimes it's like, God, should, this person just asked me out. Should I like say yes? This person asked me to marry them. Should I say yes and go down the aisle with them? Like we bring this question, God, speak to me, to silly things and heavy things in our lives. But you know what's interesting to me is that when you like, you know, thumb through the story of God, Old and New Testament, and how God has moved through human history, like you see God speaking all the time throughout the pages to his people, but it's not for the things that we seem to ask God for. It's not for that daily hit of wisdom, like you're at a fork in the road, God, should I go left or should I go right? God, should I take this job or should I stay in my job? Uh, It's not those kind of things that God speaks to. God, um, he always speaks in moments that convicts his people, that challenges his people, that shakes his people, that gives them a place where they need to trust him more Uh, gives them an assignment, something dangerous to do that they don't think that they're prepared for or possibly the right person for. When God speaks, more often than not, we get God speaking to to us an assignment, not just comfort, not just a moment where we feel better about ourselves, but he speaks to us something to do so that we can lock arms with him, so we can link our steps with him, so that we can partner with him. And we see this all throughout the heroes and the sheroes of the Bible, from Moses to Joshua to the prophets to Mary to Peter to Paul to all these people that we look up to. They all heard God's voice and they had the guts, the courage, the grit, the chutzpah to walk in his direction and say, yes, listen. So that's the kind of way that I think we need to shift how we think about prayer and how we shift about God speaking to us. But before we go any further, um, we just need to talk about like what prayer is. Because I think a lot of times we come to church or you hear people pray out loud and it sounds like they're rehearsed or they've got all the right words and you can't imagine yourself praying with all the theological uh, mumbo jumbo that people are throwing out at you. But bare bones, you guys, prayer is communication through communion with God. Prayer is communicating to God through communion, through being with God. That's all that prayer is. It's talking to God through being with God. And isn't it true that all great communication is not just one way? Like how dysfunctional would our relationships be if one person is doing all the talking and the other person is just nodding their head and going, yes, yes, yes. And please do not nudge your neighbor if that's talking about you. But all great communication is two-way communication. And that's what prayer should be for us. That's the design of prayer for us as well, is that we come to a place and a posture where we are talking to our Heavenly Father. We're bringing things before our Heavenly Father, but we're also open to hearing from our Heavenly Father. It's a two-way street. It's two-way communication. And that's what makes it so powerful. So first, if we're gonna be people that understand, like speak to me, God, and we hear God's voice, we need to tune our ears. We need to train our ears to hear God's voice. I mean, did you guys know that you can train your ear, the human ear, to do some amazing things? I mean, sometimes just throughout the the natural evolution of life and as you get older, uh, your ear can hear new things and it can really be tuned in to hear new things. You know, when you become a parent, Um, you know, you could hear kids screaming and crying all the time beforehand, but when you become a parent, like in a crowd of screaming, crying kids, you can pick out your kids cry, can't you? Isn't that crazy that your ear can be tuned to hear your child's unique, let's just call it the scream cry. I've got two toddlers at home. I know the scream cry well. 
You know, it, uh, I'm a musician, so I, I was always blown away by, uh, let me just say I was a musician. Uh, I was always blown away by people that had perfect pitch to where you could say, hey, hum an E flat note, and they could start humming a note. You walk over to a piano, hit an E flat, and they're just, hmm, the right thing. That is something that I cannot do at all. But it blows my mind that you can train yourself in your head to know what the notes are without any reference at all. Back when I was in middle school, I started getting into rock music and I wanted to be in a band. And let me clarify that. I wasn't good enough to get into rock music. I was good enough to play pop punk music because it's like three notes and a lot of attitude. And um, (laughs) that's how I started. I had a buddy who played guitar. I had a friend that played drums. We just needed a bass player. And I'm like, Oh, I can sing a little bit and I'll play bass because there's only four strings, not six, and you only hit one at a time. I can figure this out. And so I got a bass guitar and I started practicing and learning. But what was challenging for me was I would listen to these songs that we were trying to play and I tried to replicate, replicate and hear them and learn them. And I could hear the guitar really clearly. I could definitely hear the drums. I could hear the singing, but I just couldn't hear what the bass guitar was doing. It was confusing. I could hear low sounds, but I couldn't hear what the bass guitar was doing. So what I did was I would just listen in to some of the great classic songs that have incredible bass lines, and I would tune my ears to hear the bass line. And then as the song progressed and other instruments came in, I could still focus in on the bass line. Then I could hear it and try to replicate it. You guys know what I'm talking about. So what I did, I would listen to some classic songs with my dad uh, in his car uh, as we were driving back and forth between school and practices and stuff. And I, I listened to a song like this that some of you guys might remember. There's some cash registers at the very beginning, but, but then the bass comes in. That's right, it's Pink Floyd on Sunday morning. <laughs> boom, 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 boom. And I would hear that, and I would focus in on it. And then later in the song, the guitar would come in, the drums would come in, the saxophone solo, but I could really zero in, and I could hear what the bass guitar was doing, and then I could learn it. There's another great song, which is an incredible bass line that I had to learn as soon as I heard it, because the song starts with it, is this one right here. And this is going to take some of us back. All right, that's right. Some of you are, you're going way back to some moments you thought, I should not be thinking about this moment in church. Um, <laughs> Queen, another one bites the dust, right? It's repetitive, but it's powerful. And I would tune my ears. I would train myself to hear that. And as the song would build around it, I could focus in on what it is. And I do all that just for an excuse to play queen in church. Uh, no, I, <laughs> I share all that because I think part of the challenge for us in our modern times is to train our ear, to tune our ears to hear where God is speaking. So that's what I want to do for the next couple of minutes. I want to run us through some different examples and different ways that God speaks. And I want to give you some places where you're like, no, I need to tune my ears. I need to train my ears to hear where God is speaking so that we can pray this prayer. And God says, yes, and incredible things happen. It's got to start with us training our ears. So the first place, the first way that I believe God speaks to us is this right here. God speaks through your solitude. Some of us. <laughs> We don't even know what solitude means anymore, right? I mean, our life is so chaotic, so fast-paced, so driven by text messages, emails, calendar invites, responding to things, going to appointments, picking up kids, being a taxi for our kids to get to the next thing. I mean, it's just like impossible for us to even imagine having solitude, being alone, and being quiet, But there's something about the posture of us having solitude. There's something about us fighting for solitude that helps us hear what God might be speaking to us and tunes our ears, trains our ears to hear what God might be saying. You know, in the time of Jesus, uh, the Psalms were like the prayer book of first century Jewish kids. And so they would, throughout the day, they would just memorize and sing and pray the different Psalms from the Hebrew scriptures. And one of them, Psalm 4610, I'm certain was on Jesus' lips often. It says, be still and know that I am God. The psalmist says, he commands us to be still. The quiet, no messages hitting us. No media and the other communications hitting us, just simply being a human being. And from there, we can experientially know, the Hebrew word yada, that I am God. 
And we see this pattern in Jesus' life all the time because he would have moments when he was in the middle of a crowd and he's doing incredible teaching and performing healings and bringing God's kingdom to a situation. And then he would retreat and he would just be still. And I'm sure his disciples were frustrated. Like, Jesus, we still got more people waiting. What are you doing? But Jesus retreated because this was a part of his rhythm of his life, was to be still, to let the solitude posture his heart and posture his ears to hear from his heavenly father. And if Jesus needed it, I definitely need it. In some of Jesus' teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, or what we call around here the kingdom manifesto of Jesus, he teaches about prayer. And he says this about prayer. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received the reward in full. If they want to be seen by others, it's already happened. They've received it. But he says, not for my people, not for people that partner with me. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. So Jesus says, if you want to be my followers, if you want to be my people, our God is unseen, so we will do it unseen because we're not doing it for the reward of outside. But we know that there's a special type of connection that can happen when things are quiet. My friends, maybe the most countercultural thing you can do to be a Christian in today's fast paced culture, maybe the most countercultural and powerful thing you can do is to fight for moments and rhythms of solitude. To take an ordinary place, an ordinary rhythm of your life and make it a sanctuary to where you just sit and you talk to God and you, almost more importantly, listen to him in the quiet. God speaks through solitude. He always has. He always will. Next, God speaks through solitude. Scripture through the pages of the Bible. God has spoken through the scriptures, my friends, but do not miss this. He continues to speak through the pages of the scriptures. The Bible, you guys, is so beautifully complex and powerful, and it's bound through time because during certain periods of time, people wrote it, but the truth is so timeless and can speak to today. Maybe the most dangerous thing that people can do with the Bible today is just to read it. Because if you just read it, you're not letting it read you. And I think God is inviting us with this incredible library of inspiration and authority and story that we have at our disposal. He's inviting us to not only read it, but to let it read us, to let it read our pain, to let it read our questions, our doubts, our fears, our hurts, our complacency, whatever it might be, let it read you and challenge you. It's so much more than a list of do's and don'ts and stories that have a moral meaning at the end of it. Don't ever settle for understanding the Bible that way. N.T. Wright, who is a um, a New Testament scholar and author, I ran across this quote from him this week and I, oh, it just resonated with my soul. He said this, perhaps, Indeed, that is what Holy Scripture really is. Not a calm, serene list of truths to be learned or commands to be obeyed, but a jagged book that forces you to grow up in your thinking as you grapple with it. Let's not settle for the Bible just being that book that sits on the shelf because it's got all the good stories in it and all the nice like nursery rhyme things that can give us comfort. You guys, the Bible is more alive than that. It's better than that. It's a jagged book that will cut to the core of your fears and your doubts and your pains. And it'll do surgery on you from the inside out so that you can see yourself clearly, that you can see your heavenly father clearly, and you can see the world around you and people around you so that you treat them the way that God wants you to treat them. Let me just say this, like, it's maybe just my personality, Um, but like, you know, I have to wrestle with the Bible. It's not something that I just like take and it all feels good all the time. Every moment um, of my life, I am a complicated cocktail of faith and trust and of doubt and confusion. And that's just me. Maybe it's a little reverse confessional time. That's me sometimes. But all through that, the more that I grapple and keep coming back to this text, coming back to these words and stories and authority an inspiration, divine inspiration, man. I love the Bible more today than I ever have. 
I'm like, like taken and compelled by these stories and the meaning that I get from it more than ever before. And trust me, I wrestle with it as well. And I want that for each and every one of us to let this jagged book force us to think differently and grow up differently and let it speak to us and challenge us because God has spoken through this and he continues to speak through it. I talk to people often who struggle to pray and to settle down and pray because they like, I just get distracted. I don't know what to do or what to pray about. So I start thinking about my bills. I start thinking about my next meeting. And I, that's why I think it's powerful to pray with the scriptures in front of you because it gives you a guide. It gives you some truth to focus on and some truth to like put the like magnifying glass back on you, man. It changes so much. It gives you a guide and it reminds you of what's ultimately true. God speaks through scripture. So if you got out of the habit of opening up this dangerous book, man, pick it back up. Let a guide lead you through it and let God speak through it. Next place that God speaks. God speaks through art. This makes sense because God's the, he's the creator God, right? So he is creative. God speaks through art. God speaks through spiritual art, Christian art. Like the amount of times that like on a Sunday morning, we've been singing a song together and there's been a lyric or a moment from a truthful song that has hit me. Like lately, it's been inside of this, the song, um, Same God, where we're looking at all these different people through faith and how God is the same God today as he was then and how we can trust him in his faithfulness. Like it just wrecks me in a beautiful way. It reminds me and God speaks to me that he's still with me. So he does that through spiritual Christian art all the time. But like, can I like lean into that a little bit more? I think that God speaks through art that's maybe not Christian sometimes as well. Like God can use and speak through whatever means he wants to, because all truth is God's truth and God's truth is found everywhere. There's this really unique account in the book of Acts, which is the history of the early church, the first Jesus followers. And we come across this guy named Paul, and Paul is going around telling the world for the very first time the good news that Jesus is king and that Jesus was resurrected. He finds his way to Greece, to Athens, to the Areopagus. In, in Athens, the Areopagus is the place where the Greek philosophers would come and argue and talk about the deep things of life. And it's like really boring to most of us today, but it was like a spectacle of uh, and people came from all over the world to hear these philosophers argue about meaning of life and everything. And, and the Areopagus was surrounded by all these statues and all these graven images and idols. You got to imagine Paul, who is this man, who's a Jewish man, who's now following the Messiah, Jesus, seeing all these graven images and idols. He's probably like, oh, this is not good. This is not good. This is not good. But Paul gets this chance to come and preach. He gives an audience at the Areopagus around all the philosophers in this pagan place. And Paul's sermon is amazing, you guys, because he speaks truth, but he speaks truth in a unique way. Uh, this is what Paul says in his sermon at the Areopagus. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. He is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own prophets have, poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. He starts to tell them, like, you guys have all these statues around, but the God that I'm talking about, like, he's not contained in gold or silver or made by human hands. But he makes this point in an interesting way. He says this, this phrase here that's highlighted, for in him we live and move and have our beings. And that sounds like a deeply Christian idea, right? That, that God is the energizing power behind everything that we are and who we are as people. Like that seems like deeply Christian, right? But did you know that he's not quoting the Old Testament? He's not quoting Jesus. Uh, most philosoph or most uh, Bible scholars believe he's uh, quoting this Cretan philosopher, this pagan philosopher by the name of Epimenides. And you guys have no idea if I pronounced that correctly or wrong, and I'm just gonna roll with it. Epimenides, who said, it's in him, it's in him that we live and move and have our being. He's using their cultural language to make the point. Then he moves on and he says, uh, as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. And that's a deeply Christian idea, right? That we are children of God made in his image. We are the offspring of God. But he's actually not quoting the Old Testament. He's not quoting Jesus. Paul is quoting from a Cilician Stoic philosopher by, a philosopher by the name of Eratus. And if you're looking for a baby name, Eratus is probably available. 
He's quoting people that aren't Christian, that are not spiritual, they're not followers of God at all because all truth is God's truth. And I believe this, that like God will speak through creativity, creative communication, art. He'll speak through whatever he wants to. It's just are our ears tuned to hear his voice in the things that we consume, the media that we watch, the music that we listen to? I mean, I have this happen to me all the time because I want to see everything through the lens of my faith and trusting Jesus and partnering with him. Um, just the last couple months, I watched this show on uh, Hulu. It's a mini series called Dope Sick, and it's about the opioid epidemic in America. And I mean, it's a very adult show. I mean, it's hard to watch, challenging to watch. Um, but man, God did something in me through watching this show. I mean, I thought I understood addiction to substance, um, but if I could be honest with you, I think I had like maybe a little judgmental spirit towards it. Like, come on, get it together. Come on, come on. And I watch this show and you see people being portrayed like trying to get off of opioids and the challenge and how they're so much more sick when they're not on it after they get hooked to it. And like God broke me wide open. So much so that like he's like put this itch inside of my soul that like I wanna do something to push against this issue that we have in our country. Um, and I think God put that there because I watched the show. He spoke to me. He gave me empathy. He gave me a passion to like push back against that darkness. And God does this all the time. And often he'll do this through music that might not even be Christian music. Uh, it, through songs that I love that mean a lot to me. There's a U2 song called Beautiful Day from like 21 years ago. Wow, that's crazy. It's 21 years ago. But there's this lyric in the song that I feel like God always speaks to me whenever like I have this moment of confusion or not knowing where to go. It says, if you, you know, oh, I'm going to mess this up again. It's like such a, an important thing to me. I actually have to write it down here. Yeah, it's, here it is. In the bridge of the song, Bono sings, what you don't have, you don't need it now. What you don't know, you can feel it somehow. I'll tell you the amount of times in my life where I feel like I've been walking through haze, running through haze and not knowing what to do next. Like God speaks to me through a lyric like that. And some of you might argue that like, you know, that is a Christian song and I would probably agree with you at the time. Um, but God can speak through whatever he wants to. But the question is, are you tuned in? Are you, you know, turning your ears to hear what he might say? Because he loves to speak through art. And he loves to speak through creativity. Another thing that God speaks through often that we need to tune our ears to hear is through other people. And this makes logical sense because we understand that like God spoke through people that wrote the Bible and God speaks through the Bible, like the logic is there. But sometimes I think we think that God stopped speaking through other people after that. Well, I don't believe that's the case. Like God is still speaking through other people, like divine wisdom from other people. Let me tell you the most annoying place where this happens to me is when God speaks through my wife. I mean, it's like, it's a joke, but like, it's real. Like there'll be so many times when we're having a conversation and I'm frustrated. I feel like I'm banging my head up against the wall about something. And she'll be like, you know, and it'll take my small tunnel vision and it'll widen it out and I'll see things clearer. And I'm so mad about it in the moment, but I'll see the wide aspect ratio of what's really going on. The amount of times that we've had opportunities to be generous, to give financially to something that means something to us, and I'll have a number, and then she'll bring a number, and it'll make my number look really embarrassing. <laughs> it's like most of our marriage, right? But it's in the gap, and it's in her faith that's inspiring, and God speaks to me through it, and we all need people like this. God has spoken to me through mentors in my life. Uh, God's spoken to me through some of you that are sitting in this room today or watching online that before Bridgeway was a thing, like you spoke into me and you said, Hey, I think that we could do this together. I think that Kokomo needs a different expression of church <laughs> and you could help lead the way. And you spoke that into me, and oh my gosh, you guys, like look at this today. God speaks through other people. I mean, I've seen it. I believe it. And I'm tuning my ears to hear it. I mean, of course you test it, but you hear it. But God might be speaking through other people. Just a few more ways that God speaks. Uh, next one. That God speaks through your pain. When you're at the bottom when life is spinning out of your control and you don't even know what's up and what's down anymore, when you've experienced loss, maybe a loss of a loved one, loss of a relationship, loss of a job, loss of what you thought your plan was for your life, 
and you're feeling excruciating pain. God will never waste that hurt, you guys. I mean, I've seen it over and over again. I've experienced it over and over again. There's something about the pain that we experience in life that opens us up to be more receptive to hear from God, to go where God is calling us to go. And and I've experienced this, and I assume that some of you have experienced too. Some of you have had life hit you so hard and you've experienced pain so deep that you wouldn't wish it on your worst enemy. (laughs) But somehow, with some perspective, you're grateful for it because it shaped you, it transformed you. God did something in the rubble, through the fire, he forged you to be stronger than you ever thought that you were or could be. I love what theologian and author, 20th century British guy, C.S. Lewis says. He says this, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our consciousness, but he shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Are you letting God use and redeem and restore the pain that you experience? Are you hearing from God in it? If you need to be roused from deafness and tune your ears to hear his voice, man, he is speaking in those moments. One last place that God speaks to us often is God speaks through your heartbreaks. God speaks through your heartbreaks. When you are moved deeply inside, when you see something that is just wrong, that's God speaking to you. When you feel empathy towards the pain of another and you just wish that you could do something about it, man, God is in that. He is speaking in that. He is you know, beckoning you to do something about that. If there's an injustice in our world that just like makes you not sleep at night, boils your blood to where you're angry, man. Let me just say like that could be a righteous God-given anger that you want to do something about. But don't be paralyzed. Listen to what God might be speaking there. When you see somebody who has a lack of resource and they have to ask questions that you don't have to think about because you don't have that same lack of resource, man, get curious Get used to being uncomfortable and doing something about it because God uses the things that break your heart to partner with him, to do something about it and to bring the stuff of up there down here where there is heartbreak and where there is hopelessness and where there is darkness. Man, God speaks through your heartbreaks and he wants you to partner with him. You guys, like all these different ways and different ways we didn't even look at today, God is speaking and he's still speaking And we need to tune our ears to like look in all these places for what he might be saying. And that's an important part of it. Like, are we listening? That's an important part of it. But like maybe where the rubber really meets the road is not just are we tuned to hear what he's saying and are we listening to him, but what are we gonna do once we hear what he's speaking to us? Because remember, God doesn't speak to people just so they can have a little drop of wisdom so they can just have a little bit of comfort for their moment. God is speaking to us because he wants us to get our hands dirty, to skin our knees up, to partner with him, to bring the world back to right, what's been broken, what's been wrong. So the question is not just are we listening, can we hear, but what are we gonna do about it? There's this little story in the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures in the book of 1 Samuel chapter three. And we meet Eli, who is this great priest over God's nation, Israel, a spiritual leader. And he's got a young boy servant who is training to be a priest under him by the name of Samuel. And three different times, Samuel in the middle of the night hears his name spoken. And he thinks that Eli, his boss, the priest is speaking to him. So he keeps going to Eli in the middle of the night. And Eli's like, I didn't say your name. So three times this happens. And then the last time Eli says, hey, I want you this time, maybe it's God speaking to you. This time, I need you to speak back to God and have a posture of saying, God, whatever you want, I'm gonna listen. And so God speaks to Samuel, says his name. And then Samuel responds with this powerful phrase that you and I need to take to heart as well. God says, Samuel, and Samuel says this back. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. (laughs) Speak, Lord, whatever you want. I'm your servant. I'm here to serve you. I'm here to like go under what you are saying. You are the Lord. I am not. Whatever you want, I'm listening. I'm open to what you say. And this is the posture 
that we are invited and challenged to have, right? I mean, it's, it's great to hear the voice of God, but man, it's only like half of the journey if we're not willing to do something about it. So here's the invitation. Here's the challenge for each and every one of us today. is to say this, so that we can give God your unconditional yes. God, before we know the details, before we know the timing, you have my yes. I mean, isn't it true that like we want to hear from God and we want to be a part of what he's doing because we know it's like exciting and it's a good place to be. But like we put all the conditions on it. God, maybe after travel baseball season's over, you got my yes. Or maybe after we get settled into the school year, you'll have my yes. Or maybe after the holiday run of Thanksgiving and Christmas, you'll have my yes. And we'll just kick the can down the road our whole stinking lives. And the whole time God is like, no, here, here I am. I've got an assignment for you. I'm gonna speak to you and it's gonna stretch you and challenge you, but there's gonna be life flooded from it. Give me your unconditional yes. And the reality is when we give God our unconditional yes, he may reveal a toxicity in our lives that's poisoning us and poisoning others that needs to be healed. When we give God our unconditional yes, he might reveal to us an opportunity to serve someone who is hurting, who we are uniquely suited to serve. When we give God our unconditional yes, he might give us an opportunity to give generously, financially, that we don't think is possible, but he makes a way to make a difference forever in someone else's life. He may whisper to you to do something that you don't feel qualified to do, like being part of a table group or leading a table group or serving in our community or in our church. He might whisper to you to go back to school, to change careers, to invite someone to church, to go public in baptism like Tanil did this morning. He might whisper to you. He might speak to you and say, you know, I want you to forgive someone who wronged you or even deeper and more dangerously, I want you to forgive someone who wronged your children or your loved ones. And all those beautiful stories are on the other side of us saying, speak to me, you have my yes. Your servant is listening. Man, make no illusions. For us to pray this, speak to me, you have my yes. Like that's a dangerous thing to pray because we will not be the same on the other side. (laughs) But the only thing more dangerous than obeying when God speaks to us is not praying to hear from God at all. Let me say that again. The only thing more dangerous than obeying what God speaks to us to do is to not pray to hear from God at all because the safest place, the place full of life, overflowing with purpose, the safest, most purposeful place for us is in the center of God's will for our lives. So don't miss it. Don't miss it. The opportunity is right there. Say, God, speak to me. You have my yes. And the stories that he'll write are gonna blow your mind. I've seen it, I've experienced it, and God's not done with it. Speak to me. Your servant is listening.